So time series data and time series modeling may not have the cachet of uh, topics like NLP or reinforcement learning or computer vision. But uh, reality is uh, for many data teams, time series uh, modeling uh, remains front and center for uh, what they do. And uh, the tools for uh, attacking time series modeling keep getting better. And we are fortunate today to have uh, two time series whisperers uh, with us today, uh, the creators of an open source project that has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, actually, uh, several open source projects, but one in particular has attracted a lot of uh, attention, uh, stats forecast. So, uh, Federico Garza, CTO and co-founder, and Max Canseco, also co-founder of Nixla. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thank you very much, Ben. We're very happy and honored to be here, and hopefully we can share with you and your listeners some of the experiences that we have uh, gotten through this interesting journey. So Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, as, as I mentioned, you guys actually have several libraries, but uh, um, so take me through what prompted you to even create a library in time series, given that uh, there were existing libraries, but I know the answer, but you should probably uh, tell the listeners uh, what prompted you to uh, undertake this journey. Sure, Ben. It all started when we were uh, still at college and we were doing some research in time series forecasting. We were trying to do demand forecasting for the electricity sector, and we grew quite interested in that field and started researching it. Then actually, one of our co-founders uh, published some, some articles in, in the electricity sector. And after that, we worked at a startup that I co-founded here in Mexico doing supply chain optimization for a large uh, CPG, a consumer packaged good um, company. And during that time, we realized that there were many interesting options out there, but there were none that actually uh, satisfied all of our needs as, as engineers and developers. So we started uh, doing some, some tooling around time series. We started with a a library called TS Features, and, and that was helping us build different features for machine learning models. And then we started writing our own models. And then at some point, uh, maybe we, we, we became crazy and thought, let's make this uh, our living. And we started this startup called Nixla. And the idea was to build a comprehensive set of time series libraries that helped the community through a scalable, highly efficient, highly accuracy uh, forecasting analysis and anomaly detection techniques and we created uh, the following libraries. One very classical library for statistical models, which is Stats Forecast, which has been, we have been working on that a lot. And that's giving our backgrounds in, in economics and econometrics. But then we realized machine learning should also be included and we created ML Forecast, which uh, was used to reproduce some M4 and M5 results. Then we started also developing Neural Forecast, which is a library for deep learning models, uh, RNNs, NBeats, ETC. And uh, we are also uh, exploring uh, the anomaly detection uh, uh, side of things. And those are like the main uh, uh, legs to our-, to our So, uh, so uh, uh, Federico, what are some of the key things you wanted in a time series library? I'm assuming Python, number one, it has to be something that Python users can use. So then beyond that, uh, what were, what prompted you to write your own? So what was wrong with the existing libraries? Uh, we saw, for example, that uh, most of the libraries doesn't, doesn't, don't scale. And we wanted to build a solution that uh, could be useful define for... A, define scale. So number of time series or so. What yes, do you mean exactly. by scale? Yeah. Uh, for example, we wanted to forecast thousands or, or millions of, of time series, and we found that the, the current alternatives uh, weren't able to, to produce forecast um, in the time we, we wanted to have the, the results. So one of the main things we, we take into account while building our libraries is, 
is the, the scalability that we can produce forecast in a distributed manner in, in, in a couple of, of minutes. And uh, yeah, and I actually re read your post uh, about Ray and full disclosure, I'm an advisor to any scale. So good, good job guys. But uh, uh, I'm assuming accuracy is a key thing too, right? So was there something about the existing libraries that left you kind of unhappy about their level of accuracy or was it mostly around scale? It was also related to, to accuracy. For example, one thing that we saw in the stats models library in particular is that when you have uh, outliers in your time series data, uh, usually the exponential smoothing model, the ETS model uh, breaks uh, because of the, the outliers. Uh, behind the scene, this is related to the optimizer they, they are using to 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 adjust the the model so in our library in our uh, own implementation of the exponential smoothing model we are using our own optimizer which is the nelder myth method and uh, that method uh, is uh, is it's it's very robust to to outliers so uh, we don't have to to do uh, pre-processing to to make a coherent forecasts max uh... Who, who's the target user? Because uh, he, here's the, so more specifically, when I explain time series to people, they think that you can just take any data scientist and plug them into a time series role. But time series actually requires some level of specialization, at least in the past, based on the tools, right? So are you folks trying to democratize it some more so that uh, you know, you can take your average data scientist and make them productive time series forecasters right away? We are definitely trying to make time series analysis more accessible to, to data scientists in general, and also with some of our packages and, and APIs to developers in general. That being said, we have seen, and, and we are quite cautious about this promise of magic auto ML. And as, as it is well known in the community, uh, some companies have uh, lost a lot of money uh, using out of the box solutions. Uh, maybe even the profit case should be should be quoted here, where uh, we love you, Sean. Uh, and, and, and by the way, Sean, 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 Sean is an advisor to, to me. Like he has been very helpful in the way, and and it is also well known that Sean is not longer uh, maintaining the library. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he, he did a wonderful job in like. Democratizing, democratizing, it, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also a two, two-edged sword. So, so yes, yes to democratize, to democratization, but no to the false belief that there is such a thing as magic in in machine learning. So, so, uh, I've actually had other time series library folks here, and I always kind of pitch them on my dream scenario, which you just basically burst my bubble here, Max. Which is basically the the ideal scenario for me is I have a time series and all I have to do is tell you, Hey, uh, here's my time series. I want to forecast seven periods in advance. Do your thing. I, you know, I, like in a declarative, declarative, uh, interface, you know, we, we do believe in that dream and we are hoping to, to build it together with other folks in the community. We are just cautious about the fact that we, in our own opinion, we are not there yet. Right, 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 right. So then, uh, so are mo you, most of your tools focus on univariate time series, right? Uh, mo most of them, yes. We with our libraries, you can feed a lot of time series at the same time, and also we have multivariate models. In in particular, in our neural forecast library. Uh, we have these transformer methods, which are multivariate. We have the autoformer, the, the informer. But what we have seen is that the multivariate uh, models, in some in some cases, uh, they are not very useful. Uh, for example, we, we develop our own neural forecasting model called NHITS, which is an univariate but neural forecasting method, and it outperforms the uh, this. Um, multivariate models. Maybe you're feeding it the wrong features. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think then one of the firm beliefs that we have, we, we, we like to think of ourselves as first principle, as a first principle team, and we like to go back to the basics. So at the beginning, we gain a lot of attention and we have seen great results, not even with multivariate uh, models, but with very basic econometric models that are like uh, 40 years old. And we have seen those models beating like state of the art, uh, deep learning models. It has beaten neural profit. They have beaten a uh, profit. And we're talking about simple simple ETS or simple arenas, right? And we have seen a similar thing with univariate against multivariate. So I think there is this tendency and we have suffered from it too, where like shiny new things uh, sometimes are preferred. But uh, to you and to well, your listeners, we would also recommend, always recommend, do some benchmarking first, go back to the basics and then try on improving, but don't necessarily go with the most like uh, uh, popular thing on medium or in triple AI before before you do your your homework so so going back uh, max to this notion of auto auto ts or ml so if you know if if you if we think about it in terms of levels of autonomy like in self driving cars right so level 1 to 5 so where are we in terms of auto ts that's an interesting question. I, I don't know, and I don't feel confident enough to put a number in it. I think some of the we're rules, nowhere near level five, right? No, definitely nowhere near level five. And and I wouldn't, I wouldn't. <laughs> if this was a, a car. I would, I wouldn't go into it. And and if it was driving on the street, I wouldn't go out in the street. Yeah. But what what what's definitely interesting is new development in uh, deep learning applied to time series forecasting, which has the advantages of simplifying. Uh, the pipelines a lot, so you don't have to do manual feature selection. Uh, uh, the pipelines are scalable, and I think that's that's nice. No, there is even some room for uh, uh, automatic hyperparameter optimization. We have include such auto tools in our in our neural forecast library, and we even have an auto EMA and an auto ETS. But it still requires to think about the problem, and 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 and, and to think that you are like feeding it a valuable information, right? I think the garbage in, garbage out uh, principle applies here more than possible in other fields. So, but the 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 goal is to somehow get to the point where you have a domain expert, right? For example, let's say you're forecasting inventory of an item, and you have the buyer of the item. Uh, maybe at some point the tools will get to the point where they can do their own forecasts instead of going to a data scientist who actually doesn't know anything about the supply and demand of that item, right? Yes, definitely. That, that's an idea, for example, that we're exploring with some folks at any scale, uh, something like a forecast factory where you, uh, uh, we help uh, other teams uh, that are not necessarily technical, uh, consume and even produce high quality forecasts. But behind the scenes, there's a lot of heuristics happening, right? Which models are to be used if the series is sparse? Which models are to be used if it's a long uh, term uh, horizon uh, task? So I think the whole pattern. And then there's, the user, there's also the user interface of how do you present some of the results to a non expert, right? So how do they evaluate whether or not? they could take the next step and deploy right absolutely and and there's also the the issue on on how trustworthy is this forecast right there is <laughs> there's always this underlying question about how how forecastable at all uh, uh, the signal is right and right 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 so you'd have to kind of show them a picture somehow of how the forecast is getting uh arrived at somehow right yeah probably it all comes down to the fact that we are not really predicting the future. We are rather trying to quantify uncertainty right. of uh, possible future events. And, and, and decisions under uncertainty have to be made in a different way than decisions under certainty. And, and that's what we like to make our users wary about or, 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 or conscious about. So, the, so then error bars. Right. Errors bars is definitely a way to quantify uncertainty. That's what we have been doing, following some traditions. But we have also seen some exciting uh, new paradigms like conformal prediction. We have been pushed also a lot by some practitioners in the field. And there are other ways to quantify it. But but I guess the main the main message that we want to transmit is 
it's it's the future is quite uncertain, right? And we always have the assumption that this works <laughs> if the past repeats itself, which is a huge assumption. It doesn't yeah. always happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Federico, so uh, give us a sense of where are we in terms of neural models, deep learning, and time series. So, um, one thing I've no I've noticed when I've tried it, it's just so slow. Yes. So, so, so let's say I'm willing to sacrifice speed. Uh, am I going to gain a lot in terms of accuracy? So where are we uh, roughly? I think the main barrier, uh, of course, uh, using these uh, neural forecasting models is that you have uh, to have some expertise using, for example, GPUs to accelerate uh, the training or, or of your models. So uh, it's really a niche topic which needs to be explored uh, in detail. And also, I think... no, no, no. That that's your job, man. To make it easy, <laughs> to make it easy yes, for okay. us. It's so part just... of. Of now now, that, now that you're integrating with, now that you're integrating with Ray, Ray can just take advantage of your GPU, right? Yes, exactly. And that's the main reason that we are also doing research in the in the in the field. And what we have seen is that, for example, uh, for particular use cases that are very, very useful, uh, neural forecasting models, uh, even if they are not really, really fast, they provide better, better forecasts. For example, in the long horizon setting, we have seen that the, these, these methods are outperforms the, the statistical or, or the machine learning ones. So quantify outperforms uh, much, much better? Much, much better, for example, like 20% and, in terms and maybe of accuracy. Some, 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 some follow-up on, on that, on what Federico was saying, and, and some self-promotion. Uh, recently, we, we submitted a paper called Yanitz. It's a paper that we wrote with Boris Oreshkin, the creator of the famous NBITS algorithm that won some of the M competitions. And that that model is is not only twenty percent more accurate than than other SOTA models, but it's even fifty times faster than the best paper award uh, of a, I think it was a ICML, which was a transformer model. So I, I don't think that by definition deep learning has to be slow. You can you can try to make uh, models uh, sparser and not necessarily overpopulate on 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 hyperparameters. Uh, and that's what we have been trying to make explainable, efficient, and accurate deep learning models. And the NHITS is one of our like newest and proudest uh, uh, sons in that respect. And a second second promotion, uh, we are not only working with, with Ray and, and any scale for that matter to distribute computing, but we have partnered with uh, Fiuk, uh, a very cool startup from two guys from, from, from uh, Lyft and, and Prefect. And with Fuke and with the Fuke integration, now you can use Ray, you can use Spark, and you can use Task in the back uh, end. And we are talking about clusters, not necessarily one uh, computer clusters. We're just changing one line of code. So that's that's hopefully also going to help a lot of folks um, run um, algorithms, training, and, and and predictions a lot faster in a distributed manner. But then you have the heterogeneous hardware thing too, right? So I endorse Ray and Spark. Because I'm also an advisor to Databricks. So. We 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 have seen so many weird things when running the same models and algorithms on different machines. Yeah. Like even same operating system, if the processor, uh, if the CPU changes, you have different like rounding wow. uh, things which converge differently. So so it is. I mean, what you're what you're pointing out is definitely a thing. And and we are not like super experts on hardware, so it has been interesting to see how how complicated it can get but again we're trying to abstract that complexity away for the end user so they have like a, 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 a friendly interface for running a, in hyper clusters so what is uh, uh, at a high level what is this uh, uh post that you wrote around ets comparing ets to neural profit what was the uh, what was the objective there and what was the fi key finding so the main objective was to provide the community with a fastest, uh, with a faster implementation of the ETS model, the exponential smoothing uh, method, and um, 
we, we based our implementation in the R implementation of, of, of that model. And classic, we wanted classic, yeah. we wanted to, to compare this statistical method, which is a baseline method, to a more complicated method, which is a neural profit uh, model, which is a profit, but with uh, deep learning. So the main purpose was uh, to show that simpler methods, statistical ones, outperforms the, the, the deep learning method, methods if they are not used uh, in an intelligent manner, right? So uh, one of the key findings uh, was that- So this uh, doesn't, you're not saying that, because uh, uh, you just said earlier that deep learning actually uh, is great in some cases. So you're not saying that so this ETS method is the one you should always use? Uh, no, no. Uh, we are saying that there are methods that are good for some data sets and uh, other methods are, are better for other data sets. So, so as, was, as, as Max was mentioned, uh, you always need to start with a benchmark. In this case, we want to provide a, a good be benchmark, which is the, the ETS model. So, so now, so you guys have now several libraries, right? So the stats forecast, ML forecast, neural forecast. So can you give us a, a sense of, of how people are using these libraries? Are they using it mostly to just uh, play around, experiment, or are you starting to hear people actually using this in production or? That's a great question. So we are already hearing from very interesting companies using our software in production. So there is one ride sharing a application that wants to do anomaly detection with, with our stats forecast package. What they like about uh, the package is that it's very fast. So it scales with uh, millions of time series. Uh, we also have a big like four consultancy using our software for hierarchical forecasting. Uh, uh, some 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 engineers at Databricks, I think, are trying to to implement some of the hierarchical forecasting features to offer them to to their clients. Uh, we also have some smart grid or micro grid uh, companies using our software for uh, peak shaving and and peak avoidance. And recently, we also have spoken with some telemetry and observability companies using using our libraries. Uh, the neural forecast one, the one that has the new fancy models, is still very complicated to use, and that's probably one of the things that we have to work on. But some researchers have been able to, to run it and, and use it for their own researchers. So some universities in London, uh, Amsterdam, and Germany have, well, researchers there have contacted us to, to, to tell us that they are trying to use it and to report some, some bugs. So how do you how do you folks divide resources around these three libraries in terms of engineering and de developer resources? So uh... <laughs> inefficiently, inefficiently. Yeah. Yeah. So, I... so uh, it seems like the so the stats forecast obviously is the most mature, has the most users, has the most stars, uh, but in some ways maybe that also requires the least development time right now is that fair to say or i i think again we started like we wanted to 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 do the same path that the field has done so we wanted to start with the basics and build upon the basics so we don't wanted to start like playing around uh, highly with uh, machine learning and deep learning before econometrics was somehow solved and i think now stats forecast has uh, uh, more or less solved uh, econometric uh, classic time series models for, for the Python ecosystem. So next week, we're going to see, we're going to release uh, one of the hottest models uh, that has been produced lately in, in statistics, the complex uh, model that also won uh, second or third place in one of the latest M, M competitions. Um, and, and that's the reason that, that we decided to start working on that, because we thought it was important to get the basics uh, right first and then move on. That being said, uh, we have been working a lot during the last month to improve usability in neural forecast, and you can expect uh, an important release, hopefully, in in, in the next uh, ten days. And so and each of it. these are each of these are standalone, in, right? So in the sense that uh, when I pip install neural forecast, it's not going to install stats forecast, right? And that's absolutely go go. For 
Yeah, yes, exactly. We wanted to have like an ecosystem for time series forecasting. So if you want to use only neural forecasting models, you just have to pip install neural forecast. But if you want to prove uh, machine learning models, you 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 can install ML forecast. But if you want to use statistical models, then stats forecast. So so is ML forecast going to be kind of like the caught in the middle here because you have the classic and then the neural. So is ML forecast going to be somewhat orphaned? Uh, I, go, Max. I, 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 don't, I don't think so, Ben. Uh, we, we, we define maybe vaguely uh, machine learning as uh, decision trees. So basically, what we're offering there is uh, XGBoost like GBM and hopefully soon also CAT, uh, the, new, the new CAT model. Uh, so I think each model serves, uh, each library serves its purposes. And, and we wanted to make it very modular and very easy for the community to choose. And maybe we're sacrificing like a attention in the sense that we are not just pushing what library, but like five at the same time. But on the other side, if you're just interested in using, I don't know, hierarchical forecasting with your own models, then you can just pip install that and don't care about the dependency hell that is maybe uh, necessary with uh, like CUDA, you know, if you want to use uh, 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 neural you know, forecasting methods. I, I think what you guys should do is, you know, if you've ever seen this kind of diagram in scikit-learn, right? So where you go, it helps you decide what, uh, what model to use. So you should have some kind of diagram for the user, right? So what kind of data do you have? Uh, and then boom, you should use neural forecast or you should use stat forecast. That, that, that's a great idea. And, and what we were thinking is not only like diagramming our like uh, Nix lovers, as we would yeah. like to call it, but also helping the user with heuristics, for example. Again, now if you have sparse series, not only which library to use, but maybe which models even to use. Right, 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 right. Yeah, because uh, the stats forecast actually you can feed, uh, you can feed it multiple models at once right yes, exactly yeah which which is uh so by the way uh max you you kind of threw in like a a, a big statement there you go now that's economic econometric and stats forecast is solved <laughs> i guess for python users is what you mean right so and 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 after saying it i i, I realized <laughs> that it sounded somehow uh, <laughs> too, too too ambitious that's what that is what I appended it with the back for classical models. I mean, it is solved in the sense that there was a large uh, pending task for the Python ecosystems, namely to bring all the knowledge and efficiency from R, and specifically from the wonderful job that, that Rob Heinemann has done uh, uh, with such classical models. And I think we we are just missing a couple of the classical econometric models. So we don't have Garch model, which is something that we want to Garch. include. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It, it, a lot of financial like guys have asked us for for Garch. Uh, I and, used that back in the day in a hedge fund, man. Garch. I'm, yeah. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the risk of dating myself, this was even before R, so it was using S plus. Yeah. So, oh, which which is the which yeah. is the language that R was yeah. built upon. No? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, how do you decide? when an algorithm should be included in one of these libraries. So what? So do you follow any of these benchmarks? So by the way, uh, uh, for listeners who are not familiar uh, with time series uh, in general, so what is the equivalent of like uh, ImageNet for time series? You've mentioned it a few times. Uh, I think the, the equivalent to ImageNet, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, neural forecasting algorithm would be uh, the Ambits model, which was- the No, 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 first... but I mean, uh, what competition do you, is there uh, like a specific competition uh, for time series? Right? The, the, the M competitions, which are organized for by the professor Makridakis. Um, I think that's so, the so, main reference. So you, you folks in, uh, then monitor what's happening there. And then when something surfaces, you- you decide whether or not to include is that kind of how you so for example with stats forecasts how do you decide if you your need to add something we basically see what's what's out there what has been used uh, uh, 
recently and what works. Also, for, for example, we have seen that the Autoarima model is widely used in the forecasting ecosystem, uh, but um, it wasn't um, really, really robust or really scalable. So we decided to implement using implement that model using using Numba to make it faster. So we are really seeing what's happening in the community. And based on that, we, we decide which models we want to, to implement. And, and maybe a call to action here, Ben, uh, we're always happy uh, to take requests like uh, the Karch model, for example. That's something that we were thinking about because people explicitly have asked for it. So if, if you or any of your listeners want to something to be included please don't don't hesitate to to reach us at our slack or to open a, a github issue so we've talked a lot about models but obviously for people who w simply want to use or productionize these uh these libraries so what are some of the priorities around helping people uh who are not that interested in models frankly but more interested in in making sure this is rock solid, robust, and so on. Yes, absolutely. So what we have been working a lot on lately is a higher level abstraction classes that make the interface a lot easier. So as you were saying, stats forecast has a stats forecast class where you simply input the data frame, the horizon, and the list of models that you want to use. And, and then more or less automatically helps you like uh, fit all the models and even choose the best model. We are also thinking about building ensembles on top of that class so people can like have the best of the possible combinations of the models. And what we're doing now is bringing that same paradigm, uh, uh, the SK with, with an SK learn syntax with fit and predict uh, to the neural forecast library and to the machine uh, learning uh, library. So as you can see, it's going to be very easy for someone uh, without that uh, much technical knowledge to have proven robust and scalable models uh, to work with. And, and as you can see, once we have those three building blocks, it becomes very easy to maybe integrate them in a higher level class that calls all different like families of models and ensembles them and offers very interesting results. So that's that's probably something exciting for, for the new year, no? how to run different families of models in a single pipeline that is efficient, distributable, and then chooses uh, like the best assembling. Right, 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 right. So I don't know if you guys saw this post from Amazon, which described their 10 year journey from stat models to neural models. But uh, one of the main takeaways for me is, you know, time series is still uh, hard and under-resourced and, you know, because as you read this post, you go, so this is Amazon's 10 year journey and they're describing a team with a lot of people. I mean, they started out with 10 people now, I think a hundred or 200 people in this team. <laughs> so, so, so I was just telling someone the other day, you know, people think that time series is solved and uninteresting, but you look at it, you look at a post like that, you realize, you know, this is one of the leading companies and, they had to throw a lot of resources at this problem because it obviously makes a huge business impact. And yet we kind of think that, yeah, this is not that interesting or not, you know, uh, it's largely solved, but it's not, right? So I, as, a, as a practical practical thing that you can do at scale, you know, in the most accurate way, right? So it's not, it's still not that accessible. You guys are trying to change that, obviously, right? So, yeah, absolutely, and 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 I believe there is going to be something like a time series revolution, the same way it it happened with with NLP and computer vision, when when time series model, time series analysis starts becoming more available to I don't know web developers or mobile developers that want to integrate via API calls that their own like products, and and I think some interesting uh, uh, phenomena that you. I, I hope is, is, is profitizing this this change is the huge uh, advancement of time series uh, databases. So if you see what's happening with InfluxDB, Prometheus, oh, yeah. TimeScale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do you, do you think that this? So I, I'm I'm kind of torn. I'm friendly with a lot of the a lot of them, but uh, 
and I can see the value, but then you're bringing in another piece of infrastructure and you know, at what point, at what point do you say to yourself, well, maybe I can do this with uh, a lake house and throw in an index and maybe that's uh, good enough, right? So. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not advocating for yeah. or against the time series databases. I'm just saying that the number of users that they have. That they're, is, they're collecting, that they're at least they're collecting the data, right? So. There, there are a lot of smart engineers out there paying for <laughs> time series databases to collect, store, and analyze millions of different time series being produced, I don't know, from IoT, sensors, web telemetry. And, and that's definitely something that is a huge opportunity for us all in the field because, as we like to say, if someone is interested in spending so much effort and energy into storing the past, then probably he's a lot. He's very interested into knowing the the future, right? Or or predictions about those data. So so I think I think a lot of things are happening that will make this like time zero revolution become a, a, an actual thing in the next couple of years. So, uh, Federico, what what will be the main delineation between open source and non open source Nixla? Um, I I think one of the advantages we have or that we are offering to, to the community is that in our in our products which uh, in principle is a is a is a API you, you can upload your your data and you can uh, have forecasts is that uh, we are using our own implementations and our own models so you can you can really understand what's happening with the code and that that things that that thing I think it's a big advantage uh, compared with AWS forecast or another um, solutions for for forecasting such as data EQ and so among, so there won't others. be there won't be models that only ex exist in the in the cloud service. So we're all, not in the all, business of. Of predicting the future, but but foreseeable, foreseeable, we want yeah. to keep at least all the models open source. We do believe that the best way for models to become better and proliferate is is through open source, through collaboration, uh, and and and. So you will, but uh, what you offer then is the best managed, hosted service for people who don't wanna, who simply just wanna call an API, right? So. Exactly for for teams that that want to to deploy to production faster, that want maybe to have like an exposed API without the hustling of building the actual pipeline. That's that's what we would like to build our commercial offer upon, namely making life easier for people, manage services as as you mentioned. Ben. I hope you chose the right license, because the cloud <laughs> providers may may take your library and offer it to. <laughs> <laughs> It's not, it's not like it hasn't happened before with some very important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so in closing, so what's in the near term roadmap, six to 12 months, what, what, what should people expect? So uh, expect like in the, let, let me talk about the short term because we have so much, so, so, so much going on. So, so probably the, the short term is better. Uh, Expect uh, the release of the complex exponential smoothing. I think that's going to be an exciting model for the Python community to use. Expect a release of the neural forecasting, a complete refactoring of the neural forecast library that's going to make life a lot easier. Expect some more work on probabilistic hierarchical forecasting, which is also a very hot, hot topic in the industry. A lot of people are asking for that. And expect, uh, hopefully, us being more active into trying to to uh, uh, talk more about like what we are doing and, and hopefully help more people with their forecasting uh, analysis tasks. So Federico, anything to add in terms of uh, near-term plans? Yes, also we want to make better our documentation uh, because we think it's one of the greatest things that Profit did. So we want to to improve uh, the use cases, the documentation, how to use stats forecast, how to integrate the different uh, libraries in the ecosystem. That's one of the things we we want to to release soon. And uh, and please improve the error messages as well. So <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and with that, thank you, uh, Max and Federico. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben.